Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, our speaker tonight is, is um, mm -hmm. like says, Howard Matthews. He's a member of Christchurch Rotary Club, District 1110 Shelterbox Coordinator, and a volunteer speaker for Shelterbox, which is what he's doing tonight. So Shelterbox was founded in 2000 by a Rotary Club. It's an official partner with RI, and Rotarians throughout the world helped to buy shelter boxes to help families in need of emergency shelter. So this evening, Howard will be describing how shelter box has changed since it was founded, how COVID has affected the work that shelter box does, and where shelter box has been needed recently. So over to you, Howard. Okay. We'll share screen. Right, whoops, back a bit. You should all have a slide in front of you, I trust. Yes, thank yes. you. Good. Yep. Uh, and, and if you could mute your um, microphones to him so we don't get any feedback, that would be great. And with the immortal words, those of you who are my age will probably remember Listen With Mother. And Listen With Mother always started with if you're sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. So 21 years of shelter box are going to cover tonight. We're going to look at it today and how coronavirus has affected us and what we've done. So let's put up a little bit of perspective. At the moment, there are 113 million people who are homeless because of disasters and conflict. Breaks down to about 83 million conflict and 30 million disasters. And if I could just say, in 2020, that was 103 million, so it's gone up in one year by another 10 million. So it's our 21st anniversary this year. And we were started by the Rotary Club of Helston Liz in the year 2000 as their millennium project. And our, our, the, the founder then decided what would families need if they lost everything in a disaster? They got a box and put everything in, and there were a variety of things in there from trenching tool to sleeping bags to water filtration, to lots of things. And over the years, we, we have changed dramatically. And that's what I'm going to cover to start off with. So what is our purpose? Basically, we provide emergency shelter to those families who have lost their homes to conflict or disaster, giving them the tools, advice, and more recently, the training they need to support them and their communities and their recovery. And that training in the last year has often been um, over the internet. So as we grow, uh, we've offered a wider range of aid, and built a global network of partners that are helping us to reach more people. So how have we changed in those, in, in those 20 years? Well, we've gone from a local charity based in Helston Lizard to become a recognized world specialist on emergency shelter. And this really kicked off after the big Asian tsunami. So we've moved, by the way, from, from Helston and are now our head office is in Truro. The most important change, which I want to sort of instill to you tonight, is that initially we started up with a green box. Everything went in the green box and every family in need had a green box. Regardless of what they needed, they had a green box. We've now changed from that one size fits all to a more bespoke approach. And because every response is different, our teams go in and say, what do the people actually need? What do they need to rebuild their lives, their communities? Only then can we give them what they actually need. And this, of course, saves money, donors money and uh, as well. As I said, we've moved from a central Helston Warehouse, where volunteers from Helston used to come in and pack our boxes for us and we have to ship them out. We now have pre-positioned stock around the world in key United Nations hubs. The stock we send out by sea, which is a lot cheaper, and uh, it's stored free of charge in these United Nations uh, sources. And they're in places like Panama, uh, Europe, uh, Philippines, Pakistan, Australia, New Zealand. So they're in fairly close to uh, where we want to use them. Um, by send, the other thing I forgot to mention, by sending the, the 
the, the kits now out on pallets rather than it packed in boxes, it saves us a lot of money. Um, for example, uh, by taking the boxes themselves empty and stacking them, it saves 30% freight space, which is equivalent to about 10% costings. Uh, so it, this is really a money saver as well. And we've got, uh, before the pandemic, we had about 20,000 shelter kits in pre-positioned around the world. The other thing we're doing now is after a major deployment, we send back a team on a method of evaluation and reviewing the aid. We ask the people, did it work? Did the aid work for you? Could we do better another time? And this builds up a rapport and we get to know uh, the area, we get to know the people, what they need. And also we know if our aid is actually doing what it should do, we're not wasting money and they're not throwing it away. Over the 21 years, we've deployed on 300 disasters in 98 countries. Yeah, most people can remember the some key, key disasters like Haiti and Nepal, but 300 disasters in 98 countries. And in April this year, we reached that milestone of helping 2 million people who were supported with shelter and aid. So how does Shelterbox aid help families without shelter. And just a reminder, shelter is so important uh, because without shelter, it can be a life and death situation. So the, the key things which you'll probably recognize is on the bottom left, you see the shelter box tents, our Mark 6 tent designed for uh, um, extended families, five or six people, three compartments inside. So it's like a home and it has privacy within that home. And um, it just stand wind speeds, 110 miles an hour, UV light, uh, protective, temperature range of minus 20 up to plus 50. And there's a typical example of the shelter box tent in a disaster area, the ruins of homes are around it, and, and that reasonable structure in the, in the left there has people's possessions there. But within that tent, that is their home while they rebuild their lives and their communities. Might be three, might be six, might be nine, might be 12 months, however long it takes, that becomes their home. So other things we do on the bottom right-hand uh, slide, of the slide you'll see uh, we do mosquito nets, uh, we do water filtration, we do solar lighting, we do uh, pot stainless steel pots and pans. And but one of the items to the top right hand side there is a blanket. Not too excited to get about a blanket, but for 18 years we used to supply blankets which we thought were pretty good. And when we did this method and evaluation, the people said, yes, the blankets are good, but they don't keep you that warm which method of value told us, okay, doesn't work. We look for something better. And this is a, a new blanket we've been doing for a couple of years. It's a TOG 7. It's not wool, so it dries out quickly. And it can use for a blanket, use for a partition, whatever. And so it's, it's a pretty important piece of kit on cold winter nights, particularly in places like Syria. And the other thing on the bottom right of the slide are a variety of tools and tarpaulins, which I should come on to in a minute. We have two sizes of boxes now. Um, the traditional box, which you know at the bottom, which takes a, a hell of a lot of kit, but also we have a smaller uh, totem box there for when people only want something like a cook set, a mosquito net, uh, water filtration, solar lighting, and they don't need bulky things. And one of the things we often do now uh, is that we send, as I said, the kit out on pallets. And when we get to the disaster area, we will give the, the beneficiaries an empty box and they will go along and we'll say, go to the box, we'll put in a blanket, we'll put in a light, we'll put in this, and like a little assembly uh, run. And this is often where Rotary comes in and helps to do that. So by packing the boxes on site, saves us money and time as well, it's much more efficient. The other item of kit, which some of you might not be familiar with, is the shelter kit. That started when our teams went in and they, they found uh, a disaster area, people had just lost a roof. They got the house, the walls, their possessions, but just lost the roof. And they found it was, they couldn't really give them the whole kit. Um, so what was needed was a repair kit, hence the shelter kit, which is there to make emergency shelters or just repair damaged buildings. And what it contains is two very heavy duty tarpaulins, seven by four, um, a variety of nails, saw, wire, hammer, 
um, rope, uh, a spade, and a hoe. All the things which you can repair your dwelling with to make it waterproof. And a lot of governments do like people to stay in their premises, not move out of their, their villages, and by repairing them, they can stay in. Now, here's an example of that. There's a tarp wall, and this was taken in Somaliland in 2019. And there, this young lady uh, is got a crude shelter, uh, but over the top, we put a tarp wall. So it makes it weatherproof, much more stable. The black edge is the reinforced area where you put the nails, when you're using nails. And there you can see the shelter box and with a couple of gray blankets protruding out of the top. So that's one use of tarpaulin. The other use of it, uh, is this was taken in India last year after the um, flooding, is that um, the beneficiary can build a crude wooden frame. There's lots of wood hanging around. We give them the tools, we give them the saw. And, and then with the tarpaulins, they use one to wrap around as walls and one for the ceiling. So they build themselves a reasonable shelter. It's not four star, it's not five star, it's probably only one star, but it's a shelter. And those tarpaulins are pretty resilient. And so we teach them how to do it. And so they can build themselves a reasonable shelter. Couple of, I want to cover a couple of the items which we put in. Water filtration, vital there, safe drinking water. And this is our first aid station. Another one which um, came from method and evaluation because before we used to give, some of you might have heard of, is the, um, do you know, that's gone right out of my mind, how embarrassing there, the, the blue life straw, the blue life straw. We found it didn't work very effectively after a method of evaluation. So we bought in this first aid station. It's a bag, which at the top has a, a crude filter, like a coffee filter. You clip it onto your, um, your dwelling and you pour water in the top. The, the coffee filter takes out the sticks and stones and insects and what have you. But the main work is by gravity feed down to that black filter, which is a carbon silver filter. And that gives about 99% drinking water. And that will do about a uh, 1100 litres, which will keep a family going for about a month until other agencies get a more permanent supply on. And uh, there's an example of this gentleman there in his shelter kit building behind, which you can see, hence the black line. Um, he's using a bucket. Now, normally we supply two plastic jerry can cans. We give them two, one for them to gather dirty water to put into the filter, and the other one is to always have the clean water in so there's no cross contamination. So that's the water filtration we put in. Next, light. Uh, very important, you're in a disaster area, you can't just switch on the light or there's no street lights, you probably not any candles or what have you. So you want something where you get a free sort of energy. Uh, and hence the Luminade, uh, basically it's a solar panel. Black area, you can see there's a solar panel, you hang it up outside your dwelling in the day, charges it up, and at night time when you switch it on, it'll give you either eight or 16 hours of light. Um, depending on which setting you have it. The little icing on the cake is that on the top there's a little micro USB port which you can plug into your mobile phone to charge it up from that solar panel. It won't charge it a lot, but probably a lot enough to give a, a few phone calls. Um, so this is a key thing. Not only does it give light in your dwelling for your, to do your housework, children do their schoolwork, what have you, but we give two. One of those, so you can always keep it in your shelter. The other one you can take out, and this is particularly relevant in disaster areas for ladies who often have to go out into the dark to use the toilet. Uh, it gives them a security having one of these lights to carry with them. So pretty vital piece of equipment. And there you can see this lady in Paraguay. Um, you can see it a little bit clearer there. It's a great piece of kit, and it does really give some, some good light. Next, I want to cover some of the key people in the team, our shelter box response team members. These are the guys, the volunteers who we train down in Dartmoor um, to go out, to assess what is needed. This is the key thing. They go out, they assess what's needed. We've got about 120 of them worldwide, and they're assisted by staff members who become team leaders. And um, they go out, assess what's needed to make sure the people in the disaster area get what is required. Now, when they, uh, we have a disaster, um, we cannot help everybody. 
and we, we cannot respond to every disaster. So sometimes we have to make a tough decision. We have to develop what we call our response criteria. And we have to ask certain questions about a disaster which uh, enables us to decide what to do. The first one is we have to wait for a government response. We have to wait for a government to declare an international emergency so international agencies go in. Uh, and that's why sometimes there's a delay because the governments haven't asked for international help. We have to look at how many families are involved. And we have a sort of cutoff point of about 200 families, which uh, after that, we'll always go in and help. Uh, then have we got the right type of aid? Uh, if it's a flooded area, of course, tents are no good and um, tarpaulin is no good. So we must look what type of aid we have to match that disaster area. We need to look at how long do you think will be needed? And we usually say we need to be there at least three months. Um, but I did forget to mention the teams of response team members, they usually go in in two weeks at a time and then they're replaced by another team. Um, for, for, um, fourthly, speed of self-recovery. How quickly can that country recover with its own resources? And that's another thing we need to look at. And lastly, what are our resources? Um, how thinly is our resources stretched? And that came uh, when they had the hurricanes in the Caribbean a few years ago. We were pretty stretched at that time. So we have to look, do we have the resources to cover that disaster? And one example here is in August 2020, the Beirut explosion, uh, which you all remember, we were in contact with the Rotary Clubs there and we weren't needed. Shelter box wasn't needed. Our type of aid wasn't needed for that type of urban disaster where people needed replacement doors, replacement windows, and had left Beirut to go to stay with relatives. So Beirut, we looked, we contacted the Rotary Clubs, and they said we weren't needed. Partnerships. How are partnerships been vital for Rotary? We most always work today with other aid organisations and NGOs. And these are especially in conflict zones. With partners, we can coordinate, and share information. And this leads to a much more efficient employment. For example, in Tanzania, uh, we, we worked with the Red Cross. The Red Cross provided the local contacts, and personnel, and we provided the aid and the training. And by working with partners, it helps us go further, faster, and it gives us the flexibility to work in different areas. One partnership here, and this picture was taken in Syria, we were working with relief aid because in a conflict zone, our people can't go in. Despite the strict, the stringent security checks we have, it's not safe for them to go in. But by working with partners who sign memorandums of understanding, we train them how to use our, our, our kit, they distribute it on our behalf because it's safer for them to go in. So we work with partners now in every conflict zone. Um, but one, of course, the big partnerships is with Rotary. We mean project partners since 2012. We have common aims. And this picture was taken in Paraguay during the flooding there. And on the right, you'll see one of our response team members with a Rotary. And what they're actually doing, they were sorting out instructions um, to build uh, shelter kit homes, which were printed in Spanish. And, and Rotarians are, are involved in about 96, 97% of our natural disasters. They direct us to the areas uh, where the villages, particularly which might be lost uh, in, in the countryside, they tell us where to go. They will provide logistics. They will help us with uh, consignees at airports. They're a wealth of information on the ground. So the Rotary Partnership is really so important to us. So how did we do last year? 2020, despite being a COVID year, we actually helped more people than we did the year before. Just under 180,000 people we supported, which equated to just under 36,000 families. And of those, 28,000 families we supported with emergency shelter and household items, that's like pots, pans, filtration, solar lights. But 7,000 families, when they were assessed, they just needed household items. Uh, they didn't need shelter. They might have been in camps and they just needed um, cooking sets, lighting for water, water filtration. We were in 17 deployments in 19 countries. 
And in 2019, we actually helped about 149,000. So we actually were able to help a lot more people despite COVID. Where are we at the moment? Um, these are the countries we're working with at the moment, and I've divided them into the, the stages. First of all, the assessing stage. We're watching constantly. We're not only watching from Truro the weather situation, so we're looking at what happens with weather fronts around the world, but we're looking at the political situation. There, we're assessing Yemen. Um, we're assessing flooding and landslides, which has just happened in Nepal. And we're assessing the Philippines, where there's been a volcano eruption. The Philippines actually is our biggest customer. We've been there 27 times in uh, the 20 years. And in fact, we have set up an office in the Philippines, Shelterbox Philippines, and it was Rotary which helped us to set that up. By having an office there, it means we can get it quicker, less government bureaucracy, and uh, so Rotary is really key in, in getting us into the into Philippines. When we're assessing continuously, but also we're planning. We've been in Nigeria for quite a while and we've had various numbers of phases which have gone in. And we're, uh, Nigeria uh, is suffering from um, Boko Haram, uh, driving people out from the homes into camps. And um, uh, we, we, we've helped there several times and we're planning at the moment on their current situation. Mozambique is another one we're planning. They've got... Um, the problems at the moment with uh, Islamic uh, people attacking um, communities. And we haven't been in Mozambique for several years. So at the moment, we're planning stage, building up a partners and seeing how we can go in when we're actually needed. Then we get to the actual implementation stage uh, in countries like Burkina Faso. Problems there, million people displaced again due to um, Islamic uh, extremists there. And we're helping in there. Uh, we're in the Cameroon, which, like Niger and the Chad Basin, is suffering from Boko Haram driving people from their homes into camps. And Ethiopia, which is um, struggling uh, again through um, conflict. Then, after the implementation stage, we go into the evaluation stage and we're evaluating. We, well, we've been in Syria about 10 years, but at the moment, or just recently, there's been flooding, and we've helped them there in the northeast of the country. And we are evaluating how we helped. And Sudan has had flooding. Uh, it's had flooding on and off for about a whole year now. They're really struggling there. And we are evaluating how our work has, has been going on there. Looking at a couple of these deployments, a little fraction more detail, Syria, our largest and most sustained response. Um, we've been there in the 10 years of conflict, 12 million displaced, and we've been working with Relief Aid and Baha organization. We've helped about 400,000 people, 80,000 households with tents, solar lights, thermal blankets, and household items. Uh, and we've gone aim for the remote and hard to access regions, which the big players don't go to. We look for those places. That's why Rotary helps us. Um, so Syria has been a big response. Uh, their families, like um, this particular family, Hamda, uh, home was bombed, she was uh, walking, went into a camp, uh, food was short, and um, when we found her, we were able to give her a tent, blankets, and household items, and um, so we helped her to rebuild a life. Another example of a natural disaster, which is fairly recent, was Honduras, category four hurricane in November, and we were working with Habitat for Humanity and the Rotary Clubs there, and we distributed about just over 3,000 household items with shelter kits and household items. And that stock came from Panama, uh, where it was pre-positioned. Great thing about this pre-positioning is that you can restock by seed, which is cheaper, slower, but it's cheaper, and uh, gradually keep building the stocks up in uh, on Jaws. Anything will do to transport your aid, wheelbarrow, whatever it is, and that white bag, of course, is the shelter kit. And you can see we, where we've given them blankets and other things. Burkina Faso, as I mentioned earlier, a million people displaced, and we've been working with the German partnership uh, help. Uh, we've helped about 700 families with shelter kits, household items, and this is where we come into COVID. We've also been giving hygiene kits, which include face masks, soap, some washing basins. And there is in Burkina Faso, uh, one of our partners is showing the beneficiaries uh, how to use the Luminade lamp. What you see is all their aid is piles 
and why it's in those piles like that, I'll, I'll cover later on. So why are refugees and internally displaced people especially at risk during the COVID pandemic? Well, that was taken in 2020 in uh, one of the uh, camps in Syria. You can see what life is not really that good there. Uh, the water on the floor and the, the type of uh, shelters they have. Uh, on the left there, you'll see the lady from Relief Aid with whom we partnered. So how can we uh, help people in, in these COVID situations? Well, the first thing, tents and shelter kits give uh, a central emergency shelter. It enables people to move out of these overcrowded camps. Some of these camps have about 60, 70,000 people in, and uh, uh, others are living in um, buildings which have survived after disaster, which might be just a school or a church. Um, and they're often separated from the sexes are separated in these camps the children from their parents it's, it's a grim place to be and so by giving them a tent or a shelter they have a private space to socially distance so that was taken in Cameroon so from that situation hopefully we can go to that situation which enables people to socially distance Next, we can improve access to good hygiene by customising the age packages with masks, soap, washing basin, simple things which are so vital in, in this COVID times. Uh, and also by giving them their own cooking sets and their own filtration and mosquito nets, they don't have to share. And if they're not sharing their cooking items, they're not spreading. So having their own things are so important. Simple things, soap, a bowl. This young lady in Syria enables her to wash her hands and with the right training, uh, help to prevent the spread of COVID. The next thing is we can promote better health. Simple things like telling people not to shake hands, encouraging these behavioral changes uh, to explain how to reduce the risks of COVID. And there, that was in Ethiopia last year with our partners, International Organization for Migration. Um, they were showing them how to wash your hands, simple as that. And lastly, by modifying distribution practices, our partners using PPE and distributing to much smaller groups. Instead of groups of 200 all coming together, we get groups of 50, so there's a less chance of spreading. The kit goes on, on these containers, which have washing facilities. And then this one was in Ethiopia again with IMO, International Organization Migration. We put all the aid in little piles and each one of the families will come up one at a time to collect the aid so they're not mixing together. So coming on to the end and how can Rotary continue to help us? Well, Rotary provide worldwide about a third of our funding and they help us, as I said earlier, delivery and deployment. And also locally, they help to spread local awareness. You do the fundraising, and I'm really glad to say that Southampton Magna have helped us since 2005 and have donated just over £7,000, which are a big thank you for those people who've helped. And, and this is a little shopping list. How can you help? I know that they're all Rotary clubs. We're all struggling. The, the, the amount of money we're getting is getting smaller. The pie to divide is getting smaller. But look at the little things that, yeah, a tent. There's a shopping list, 385. But £10 buys two mosquito nets. Uh, that solar light, two, £22, or a kitchen set for 30 These are the small prices which, however small the donation, you can give. But if you wanted to do, as I say, special uh, offer, uh, a family package with a shelter kit, around about £220. That's an approximate price because what we try to do is to procure the goods in the uh, near to as far as the country we're going to use it. For example, uh, we get uh, the stock in Turkey, which we use in Syria. And then the uh, family has the whole thing, tent, box and everything. That works about out of that 590 as a ballpark figure. So those are some of the prices which, which can help us with. Disasters don't stop. Neither do we. Uh, please go to our website at shelterbox.org, which you can see at the bottom, where you can sign up for our digital newsletter specifically for Rotarians. Lots more information, lots more stories. And quote from last year's now, um, RI president, the world needs Rotary and Shelterbox more than ever. And that brings on to next time's topic, because Shelterbox and the climate crisis 
because believe, having seen some maps recently, climate change is really linked up to these disasters. Particularly, as I said, remember earlier, um, Sudan, a year's flooding, and um, North East India had not only monsoons, but vast flooding. Climate change is going to be something which is going to influence our work in months and years to come. Thank you very much. I'm going to unshare screen now. And if anybody gets any questions, I'm just first going to have a drink of water and then fire away, please. Well, Howard, I think that was for me a, a personal bit of an eye opener. Um, my understanding of um, Shelterbox was really when we had our conference in Cardiff. And I remember seeing it and stepping inside and understanding the water filtration and thinking this is pretty special, this is pretty good. And obviously since then as a part of Rotary, we've made donations and we've financed a couple, etc. But some of the figures that you've just um, told us about, I mean, I've been watching the last couple of nights, there's been a documentary about what's going on in Syria. Yeah. Uh, and it's a bit of an eye opener when you see it. And then I heard you say, 175,000 thermal blankets um, given in Syria. Yeah. And um, to think this is 20 years old and it started in a Rotary Club um, is a bit difficult to comprehend. It's yeah. that good. It is that yeah. good. So it, it, it is, yeah. That's my take on it. So what I'd like to do is to open up um, for people to give you questions. And uh, who's first? Is that you, Neville, or are you playing with your screen? Sean, over to you. Hi, Howard. How John. Do you, how do you cope with, if you get any political interference in a country? Do you override it or what happens? It, great question. And that's really why we do have to have partnerships um, with other agencies as well as, as Rotary. Um, there have been occasions where we've gone in and local officials have said, yeah, we'll look after the kit, we'll sort it out. And we said, no, we want to make sure, response team members make sure that A, the most vulnerable get it, they use it in the right way and we can come back and find out. So yes, that can be a problem. Um, and if I remember rightly, I said earlier about a government uh, inviting us in, if they don't invite you in, um, it, uh, they can often tax your aid. And when it was the big um, Nepal earthquake a few years ago, uh, you couldn't get aid into a Kathmandu airport because it's very, very small and warehouses are collapsed on the runway. And we were trying to get it to India and India wanted to charge us 40% tax to take the aid through. So there can be a lot of political problems, and that's why it's been a great help in the Philippines by having our office there. Uh, we were able to have our own office and uh, they have, um, we're able to cut through some of that bureaucracy. But it can be a problem by having people like Rotary. Uh, and the, the example I will give you which, uh, is that many years ago, uh, we had a request from Rotarian in Shanghai who had contacts, and don't ask me what they were, in North Korea. Mm. And there was flooding there, and the North Korean government invited us in to help them with the flooding. Uh, so, yeah, we, yeah we, we do manage, by having these, end, uh, these, these partners, we do, it helps us to get round, and of course Rotary, to get round the political problems, which you, you or, or any, uh, any pitfalls which can which come as a result, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, James. Uh, Howard, um, I think I was responsible for sending one of our checks. How can I get off your mailing list? And on, I'd like to, I'll sign up to the electronic one, but it seems it save you money by, if I could get off it, and I haven't managed to. Right. Um, what I will do, grabbing a piece of paper. Um, I'll, mess with, I'll send you an email, shall I, with my yeah. address. What I'll do, I'll give you the name of Lucy Carr, who is the Rotary Liaison Manager, and put it to her, and she will just be able to do the necessary, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Great job you're doing, anyway. Thank you. Um, Peter Hall. Hi, Howard. 
Um, I did, did you know. get any help from the airlines? I mean, do they sort of, you know, when people have got to fly out places, do they do they sort of give you free seats or or, sh- or ship stuff out if they've got spare space or anything like that? Yes, we, we do have that. And I'm just trying to think of an example in, from the island of Vanuatu in the South Pacific. Um, we had help from the New Zealand Air Force who flew out shelter kits, which we had pre-positioned in New Zealand. Um, we do get a lot of help from military um, um, establishments in uh, disaster areas. The one that is always a little bit tongue in cheek, many years ago, Richard Branson um, took a photograph of six shelter boxes uh, on the back seat of um, one of his aircraft with him standing in front doing a rather PR stunt. And I think that's all they shipped out was the six boxes. Um, but we, we do, um, yes, have. Um, contacts with various airlines, particularly getting our response team members out, because often they can be phoned on a on a Thursday night and said, "Right, we want you in Panama on a, on a Saturday morning." And um, yeah, so an airlines will say, "Look, we've got two or three, four people to go out. What can you do?" And they will squeeze us in. Uh, so we do have these contacts, which we've built up over the years. Um, we, we built these contacts up and mm. um, they're, they're very useful, yeah. And as I said earlier, by going by sea, uh, things are a lot cheaper. But if we have to, we will use air, but it is a lot more expensive. Okay. Howard, um, how are you financed as a global organisation? And I know how we can help you with the different, uh, you know, tents and blankets, etc. But what's the bigger picture? Do you get grants from the government? We don't get any grants from the government. We're not big enough to go into DFID or anything like that. What we do have is 18 affiliates around the world um, in Canada, USA, three or four in Europe, and New Zealand, Australia. And they're purely PR and fundraising for us. Uh, and of course, there's, there's the Rotary, as I said, which our I, which funds uh, about 30%. We are now trying to get into the legacy donations, into the corporate donations. Um, We have our own book club, which you can see on our website, where for £10 a month, you you can get a book, uh, which are which are sort of type of books which uh, feature the work type of work we do um so there's lots of ways but it, it's still i think the rotary is the biggest one then it's followed by churches that in this country then by scouting organizations i think of the it, the sort of donors we have um but yes we 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 no government money it's all i'd say private donations okay thank you any other questions please uh, Alistair. Thank you, uh, Terry. Um, Howard, uh, thanks for your overview, which I thought was really stimulating. Uh, you, you, some headline numbers you gave us was uh, Shelterbox has helped with 300 disasters, has helped 2 million people. What's the sort of headline number uh, over the 20 years of how many shelter boxes or shelter box equivalents? Because I, I recognise it's more complex than that. How many shelter boxes have been distributed? Right. I've got to say, I don't know the answer. I know the biggest, the biggest number of shelter box equivalents was to Haiti, when it was just under thirty thousand uh, shelter box equivalents in Haiti. Um, but because we now um, we're no longer one size fits all. It's very difficult to say because some families might just have a, let's say, a, a, three blankets, a water filter, a shelter, um, a mosquito net, whatever they need. Um, it's, it's very difficult to say how many people had. But um, the other figure I can just throw at you is that in our first 15 years, we helped 1 million people. In our second in, in the years 16 to 21, we've helped another million. So in those last five years, we, we've really accelerated, or oh, there's a greater need. Uh, and the other thing, which I, it was a greater need, is when I started speaking in 2011, for every five disasters, one was conflict and four were natural disasters. 
I think now it's reversed because there's a frightening number of, of um, disasters, uh, sorry, um, conflicts in the world, and particularly in places like the Chad Basin where climate change is causing Lake Chad, for example, it's shrunk from 26,000 kilometers down to 1,000. And this has caused loss of livelihoods. People are leaving the areas. People like Boko Haram are moving in on that vulnerability. Um, so yeah, the answer is simply, I can't tell you exactly how many things have gone out. Uh, but if, if you, if uh, I'll try and find out for you and, and let them know, but I think it's a very difficult figure just to put our hands on now. But I think if we could say we've actually helped 2 million people, um, that's pretty mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take one final question now. So I see you've put your electronic hand up in the air. All right. Uh, just uh, uh, Howard, uh, excellent job. I mean, really made. And this is just for Sean, Sean, an article for you. And then could I ask Howard for an article, ain't you? You, you? you would like some an article? No, I, was, I, was, I was going to I was ask gonna... you anyway, Howard, afterwards. But yes. All right. I'll yes. speak to you right, later. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, what I'll do, I'll send you some um, something for the newsletter. Is that what, okay? Yeah, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Um, Howard, I thought I thought that was excellent. I must admit, I thought I knew about shelter boxes. I now know that I knew nothing. Uh, but I've um, I'm refreshed with um, everything you've given us. I'm just going to hand you back to Rosemary, who's going to do a vote of thanks. You're uh, muted, Rosemary. Thank you, Howard, uh, say for a very comprehensive presentation on Shelterbox. I mean, I think as Rotarians, when we do see your shelter boxes in disaster areas, we all feel very proud and um, because we all try and give something to you. But I mean, you're doing all the work and uh, the um, the people who are going out to the areas are, are, are the same. They're having to work very hard and, and they're in areas where it's very quite unpleasant on occasions. And I think what you were saying about you now use people in the areas to actually talk to people and, and explain to them how to use the kits, which I think is, is very important really, isn't it? Because it's no use giving them marvellous kits if they don't know what to do with them. And I think the idea of having repair kits and uh, also the, the solar lights, which I think are a fantastic idea, um, because it's so important, like you say, that people can actually get around and, and feel safe. And looking at, at the COVID um, side of it, I mean, we all have, have got water to wash our hands with, we've got masks, we've got all sorts of things available to us, and we've got space. But I know when you're in a, an area of conflict, I mean, I, I sort of read a book recently which was talking about South Sudan and how many people are actually packed together and how they have to wait to get shelter and tents before they can move away from the masses. And they have water running through with mud and, and, and very difficult situations to, to get washing and, and keep your hands clean. And, and so actually providing... Um, that sort of material for them to use is, is a really good way of helping them. So I think looking at, at the number of people you've helped and the, um, the way you've helped people and you've been very, like you say, it's a bespoke um, situation now. You don't actually just send everything out. You actually look and you ask them what they want. And, and I think, um, you know, shelter box is very worthwhile, and and I, I I do say thank you very much for everything that you do by telling people exactly what shelter box is now about, so that we now get a much better idea of, of you know the worldwide sort of system that you use and how you use people in the in the countries. And so, thank you very much indeed for coming to talk to us tonight, and we'd like to sort of say thank you very much in the usual way.